And then when I came to the intersection where I was to make a right-hand turn, someone had opened up a space for someone coming in the opposite direction to make a left-hand turn. And so just as I was going into the intersection, the truck made a left-hand turn and went smashing right into the oh. side of me. My guest today is Stephen Weber, who's one of the global community of people who have had a near-death experience. And Stephen is here today to share his story. Thanks for joining me on the show, Stephen. It's my honor. I, I appreciate you taking the time to speak with me. Yeah, no worries. So, uh, it's my honor as well. We were just speaking about your accent. It's the, the Long Island accent. And now I'm familiar with people that come from Long Island. I know what to... I, I, my ear is tuned to it now. Well, water, corner, woods and shutters, no ERs. That's the way we talk. <laughs> All right. Why don't we just drop into a little bit of your life prior to your experience? I'm interested in hearing a little bit about how perhaps how you grew up. And then let's talk about your NDE. Sure. I grew up on a small blue collar town on uh, Long Island. It's about uh, 50 miles or so east of New York City. And it was a rural community that was becoming suburban. And there was lots of open trails. And so when I was a young kid, I had a paper route. I bought a mini bike when I was about 10 years old. And ever since then, I've been riding motorcycles, mostly uh, Harley Davidsons once I was old enough to get a street bike, and and I just loved it. It was such a big part of my life. I love riding motorcycles. I also am a computer person. I'm an engineer, and so I'm into technology. And that was like my life, is that I work very hard with my computers, but in a lot of ways, I was an outlaw biker. I, I can't show you, but I have tattoos all up and down my arms, Holly Davidson's. And, and that was pretty, pretty much my life for the longest time. I was never a spiritual person. I grew up in a Catholic, a Christian community. The church was the center of town. And, but I was more or less a Christmas and Easter Catholic, I would say. And that was pretty much it, is that I focused on having a good time. I considered myself a pleasure maximizing unit. <laughs> I loved uh, rock and roll and cold beer and pretty girls and all those terrible things that you're not supposed to be interested in these days. That's what I was interested in until my life changed. And when I take a look at so many things that have happened, like at one time, I thought once I had this near death experience, this spiritually transformative, just wow experience, I thought that was really the focus of my life and so many things that had gone on. But I really began to learn is that that is only a small part, I believe in a much, much longer experience that really taught me about forgiveness and about not only forgiveness of other people, but of yourself and about learning and the very meaning of life. And in the end of everything, I would say that if there's one lesson that I learned from this experience and everything associated is life is good and people are good, even when very sad things happen. And that's really what I've walked away from this experience with. I know there's a couple of events that occurred, and I'm not going to give anything away. So tell us about the <laughs> events that led up to your NBA and then, then what happened after that. Sure, I'll be glad to. It's really important for me to share this experience mm. because it's very clear in a lot of ways can bring peace to people. Not only people who fear or, can, or don't know what's going to happen next and, and have a fear of death or even a fear of life, is that, is that truly... It's an inspirational experience. So I would say that it all started, I guess, back in 2005. I live on Long Island and Fire Island and the Hamptons and all well, that's all a beach community. And I would love to ride my Harley Davidson all up and down Ocean Parkway. It's a really, it's a hopping place. I loved it. And so it was 4th of July weekend back in 2005. And I was driving my Harley Davidson down the parkway. And I noticed that there was someone driving right next to me. And it seemed odd. I wasn't sure it was out of place, but there was a pickup truck not more than about five yards away from me. And, and after a while, me looking at it a few seconds, it just seemed like forever, I realized this truck was going the wrong way on the parkway. I was going northbound on the parkway and he was going northbound, but in the southbound lane. Yeah. And, and at first I wasn't sure what was going on because there was construction around 
And it's just not something you expect. It was very late at night. And I just didn't know what was, was going on. And just then, when I finally realized that this fella was going the wrong way, the divider line disappeared between us and he was right next to me. And I realized I had to get out of his way. I just, if he realized that he was going the wrong way, he was going to cut right, right into me. I need to get my thoughts together. And so I pulled over two lanes on the highway to get as further away as I could. And just right then, he went underneath the bridge and went headlong, head-on collision right into a limousine. Oh. Killed a little girl, a little seven-year-old girl, and killed the limo driver. And uh, it was a family coming back from a wedding. And they had done all the right things. They did. They hired a limousine to bring them back and forth so they could have some drinks with their families and not get in this crazy situation. And the allegation was that the fellow who, who caused the accident, and although it was late at night, uh, people were immediate on scene because it was, it was a holiday weekend. And once I saw that, I went home. Uh, when, when you're on a motorcycle, you want to stay away from traffic accidents. There's a lot of debris on the road and people are looking at the accident. They aren't looking at anything else. You just don't want to get run over. It's a very serious situation. I've been riding for decades, hundreds of thousands of miles on my motorcycles, on my Harleys. I've been around. And so I know that was a dangerous situation. So I, so I drove home and that was the end of it. I just went on with my life. I often thought about it, but, but those types of things is tragic as it was, it, they happen all the time. And it was in the newspaper the next day and they were asking for witnesses to come forward, but I didn't come forward because that I felt that there wasn't a lot to the imagination. Uh, the allegations were the gentleman was drinking. He was driving the wrong way. He hit the limousine. He killed these beautiful people and can't undo it. But it seemed very straightforward to me. And that was the end of it for about a year. And then a year later, some friends of mine called me up and said, Steve, you got to look at the paper. And, and so I, I'm a computer person. I, I didn't pay attention to local news. I was more like, big news, like world news. Oh, we're going to blow ourselves up today. Like that kind of news. I really wasn't that knowledgeable about local happenings. So I went out and got the paper and on the front page, there was a trial going on for this fellow. And he was being charged with second degree murder, not manslaughter. He was being charged with second degree murder. And it was like the first time in the United States that was going to happen. And, and after hemming and whoring it for a while, as I came forward, I really did. And it was a very difficult thing for me to do. I was a business person. I, I owned my own business with my brother. And it, it was just a difficult thing. I really didn't want to do it, but I knew I had to come forward. I came forward and I testified at that trial. I was on the stand, but for two days, the defense attorney was a very, I don't, I, I don't want to mischaracterize him. He, he, in my opinion, he wasn't professional. And he was, but he was just trying to throw things up against the wall and seeing if things would stick. And I thought that it was very apparent the fellow was driving the wrong way. The allegations he was drinking, it seemed very straightforward. And, and they convicted that fellow. And they sentenced him to 16 years in prison. Mm. And, and I had very mixed feelings about that because I understood the pain and suffering of the family losing a little seven-year-old daughter. And, and they were injured themselves, profoundly injured. But I saw the kid and he was a kid. He was just a kid who made a stupid mistake. And for the grace of God, it wasn't me because I wasn't any angel. And, and I felt I, I had very mixed feelings about it. And the family was very angry. They thought the judge should have been harsher with the defendant. And they were very bitter about it. And I understood that, but it stuck with me for quite some time, just their reaction. And I felt for them. I really did. But I also felt for the defendant in the sense like, like, it's just a stupid kid doing a stupid mistake that he can't take back. And that was it. And it changed my life. I couldn't go back to work with my brother anymore after having that experience. And so I sold out. I sold my interest in my computer company to my brother and I became a full-time dad. I had two children at the time and I did not, I didn't want to miss out. I saw what that family had gone through 
and I wasn't going to miss out a moment. And so I did some small consulting on the side from my home, computer consulting, and I took care of my kids. I was Mr. Dad. I even ran for the school board and I was elected to a school board. And that was a challenge. I was just so wrapped up in just being the best parent I could. It was my life and it was something I thought I was really good at. I really did. I was definitely an alt personality. I was a biker. I liked having fun, work hard, play hard, but I was a committed father. I, I really was. And, uh, and that's the way it went for a while until one afternoon, it was Sunday afternoon, I decided to take my Harley Davidson out to the Hamptons. The Hamptons here on Long Island is like the hot spot where all the rich and famous go. But I wasn't going for that. There's this little hole in the wall barbecue shop that I would go to. And when I'd get some ribs there. You could drive past this place a million times and not even notice it. But I just happened to notice it because I, I know certain things. <laughs> Being a biker and driving all over the place, you know the good spots to eat. So I'd driven out there and I had some ribs. It was a Sunday afternoon. Then on my way back, the road was backed up for miles. I mean, for miles and miles, the cars were not moving. You expect beach traffic, but it was really the springtime. It wasn't that warm out. There must have been some road construction or emergency road repair or something, which caused it. But I saw people were driving on the shoulder of the road to get up to the next turn to make a right-hand turn to get out of the mess and find another way. And after sitting there for a while, I decided to do that, just that, is I drove on the shoulder. And then when I came to the intersection where I was to make a right-hand turn, someone had opened up a space for someone coming in the opposite direction to make a left-hand turn. And so just as I was going into the intersection, the truck, it was a truck, made a left-hand turn and went smashing right into the oh. side of me. Yeah, it crushed my whole left-hand side, everything. I'll go into that a little bit, but but the lights went out. I, I had no idea what had happened. So you, you saw the truck and that was, it was like a, just a split second and that was truck, boom, gone. I didn't even see the truck. Right. The, the, these are all things that from reading the police report and stuff. I didn't see anything. I didn't know anything had happened. Right. And the next thing I realized is that I was laying on the ground and I was looking straight up and there was all these flashing lights all over the place and it was actually starting to get dark out. And I realized some time must have passed because everything was changed. And I remember looking around and thinking to myself, this is going to be like no other day. There was no getting up from this because that's one of the first things I tried to do is get up because as a biker, right or wrong, there's a saying, if you go down, get up because if you don't get up, you stay down, you will stay down and you'll get up right away. And I tried and I felt my leg was disconnected. It was, the skin was still there, but my leg was just flopping all around and, oh, such intense pain that I blacked out. And then, and then the next thing I knew is I was sailing through the air. I was going higher and I was going through the clouds and I was thinking what someone would think in that situation. What's happening and, here? <laughs> yeah, because it was, everything was so surreal and I didn't realize it until I started to go down out of the clouds. And then I saw a big circle with an H in the middle of it. And I realized I was in a helicopter and I was being airlifted to Stony Brook Hospital. And I knew that hospital because I'm a graduate of the university there, Stony Brook. My daughter's a graduate of this university. My mom's a graduate of the university. It's a cornerstone of our community. And it's one of the most premier trauma centers in the world. They just do incredible work there. Uh, I, I think they invented the sonogram or they did so many of the tests and micro grafting surgery to reattach limbs and such. They're, they're just a tremendous trauma center outside of about 50 miles outside of New York City. And I was outside of the helicopter. It was, if you remember from MASH, the way the helicopter was really small and it can't fit you inside. So they have these pontoons. And so I was outside and all these things it, it just took me a while to realize what was going on. And then when they rolled me off the helicopter, I realized that was the last time I was on this earth in my mind. 
in my hospital bed, I was in a coma for a month, but in my soul where I was, I spent a lifetime, lifetimes there. And it's a place I called between here and there. And it was surreal. It was the most intense, most beautiful experience someone could have. I didn't expect it. I didn't expect any of this. And I was profoundly ill. I was bleeding internally. They had to do several surgeries to stabilize, stop the bleeding. My whole body was crushed. They had to do all this surgery to put all these metal implants in me. And then my back, my vertebrae were crushed. They had to put these two steel rods in it. And then I was in a coma. And at first I didn't know I was anywhere else. I thought I was at work. It really, it was, it was no different than anything else I was experiencing. And when I say I was in another place, a place between here and there, it's like purgatory that I learned as a Catholic, except for Catholics learn purgatory is a place of punishment. You're not good enough to go to heaven, but you're not bad enough to go to hell. Go to this middle place where you do penance and you absolve yourself of sins and then you could be in heaven. But it wasn't like that for me. It was a place of learning and understanding. And it was what I felt, what I feel now is that in the same way your body transitions to come from spirit into a physical form, your body also transitions to go from a physical form into spirit. It's not like a switch. I don't believe that all of a sudden you're alive and now you're past and now you're in forever. It's a process that has to take place. At least that's what I've come to learn. And then one of the first things as I learned in that place was um, it seemed like I shared all of my experiences. I shared everything that I had with the all that is. And I received certain wisdom, certain knowledge that I needed in order to make this transformation into spirit, to make sense of my life that had passed so far, to be able to grow my awareness through my experiences. And so, um, but, but it wasn't like, it wasn't like I was sat down at a table and someone said, okay, Steve, this is spirituality 101, start chapter one. It was nothing like that. It was the very first things I learned is how to see spirit, how to sense spirit in everybody and everything. And the way I was taught, and I have to stress, I never felt like there was a, a spirit's hand on this. It felt like things just happened. It really, it wasn't like, like I, I saw Jesus or I saw this white light. I didn't see any of that. What I had was this experience. And what the experience was is I saw a friend of mine, a gentleman who I worked with 20 years ago and I hadn't seen him for 20 years. And I saw him and I was talking to him. I recognized him right away and we said hello to each other. But what was odd about it is that he hadn't aged a bit in 20 years. Nothing, not a bit. He was still the same guy. He was like from Haiti and he spoke this French Creole, English kind of language. And it was very expressive because he really didn't know all the words. And so we pantomimed him out as he talked. And he was really a jolly fellow. I really enjoyed his company. But I only worked with him for a year. So I really didn't know his, and in retrospect, I would think, why was he there? Why was he the one showing me this? But, but then he appeared to me again, but he was an old man. He was like 80 years old and I didn't recognize him at first. And, but then he did his mannerisms. He acted out things the way that he does. And I said, aren't you so-and-so? And he said, yeah, how'd you guess? And that was the starting of this game is this guy appeared to me in every shape and form. Sometimes he appeared to me as a lady. Other time he appeared to me as an Asian person or from South America, or he would change all these ethnicities and ages and everything. And over a period of time, and I keep on guessing him, sometimes it took me a while, but over a period of time is that I didn't really have to concentrate on like a mannerism to, to tip me off to who he was is I started to feel like an energy, like there was something, no matter what his form on the outside changed, there was still part of it that I could sense that didn't change. And as time went on, as I didn't even have to see him, 
I didn't even have to look at him. I could just sense and feel his energy. And that was when I realized what I was seeing was his true spirit, his Sat Nam, his soul, that part of you that perhaps was born with the universe or created with the universe or always was, but perhaps it grows and develops over time. And so by me seeing him and seeing him in all these shapes and sizes is that I realized that I could see and sense spirit. And once I could do that, as I start to look around me and all of a sudden I saw everything in a different light now because that I could sense spirit and I started to realize everything has a spirit, everything, the plants, the trees, the animals, the universe. And I started to understand that all these spirits are unique, but they're also connected that together, perhaps I'm just saying, perhaps I call it the universe according to Steve very laughingly is that I'm just saying, perhaps we are all connected. And that all of us and all of our experiences make up the consciousness. And I believe now that I believe that's the consciousness of the creator. I believe that the creation and the creator are one. Whether you believe in the Big Bang or let there be light, it explains the same thing. All of creation coming from a singularity and an infinite expansion. And this whole scenario plays out where many planets and many individuals and many species evolve and grow and develop spirit and eventually come to realize that they are the creator. If we think about now, if we think about where we are with technology, CRISPR technology and gene editing, and we've just come that this way in a short period of time, imagine us a thousand years from now, if we don't blow ourselves up first, about the technology and what we'll be able to create. And what I really think is that perhaps, just perhaps, I'll get off my thing in just a second, but perhaps the very purpose of life is to learn and grow and to really add to the consciousness of the creation and the creator through our experiences. And that was one of the first things I believe I learned there is really that everything has a spirit, we're all connected, and perhaps we make up the consciousness of the creation, that the creator and creation are one. And that was my, my very first experience. But that was the first experience of many to come because that when I was there, this kept on happening with this fellow and me recognizing who he is. And it kept on going on until I stopped learning. And each time I stopped learning, I was presented with another scenario that brought my learning to the next level. And so the very next scenario was uh, I had a life review and my life review went over and over again. I reviewed all, all the aspects of my life, but now I could see spirit and I could sense spirit in everybody and everything. So as I start to replay my life, each scenario took on a different meaning because I, I could see what everyone else was feeling. And so to me, my reality was my reality, but every other person in that situation had their own reality as well. And so as I start to go through all these scenarios in life is I learned more and more things. And then when I got to the end of my life review, my awareness was raised and I would go through my life review again because I was able to get more and more out of my life review each time I went through it. Because at the end of my life review, my, my understanding, my awareness was raised and I was ready to learn more from my experiences. And one of the things I learned that was so valuable is some of the most terrible experiences in my life. One of the most heartbreaking things that I've had, the jealousy and the hatred towards myself and other people that, that once I lived through those and I had my life review over and over, I began to understand those things in a different light. And once I began to understand it is I would feel like a weight was lifted off me is that I didn't have any of those hatreds or animosities or shamed anymore because once I understood it and I learned what I had to learn from it, I, it was liberating. It was blissful. It truly was is I know 
every day that I went through my life review is that I knew it was going to be a really bad time. I really, because you had to face some really tough things. And, but at the end that I would feel blissful. I really would. And I like bliss. I, I really do. <laughs> and I just, it drove me. It almost drove an urgency. It drove an urgency for me to learn more and more and grow. And that went over time and time again, a lot closer to infinity than one. And it kept on happening until I stopped learning. Well, and then when I stopped, no. Sorry, Steve. It almost sounds like you're on a you're on a therapist couch where you're talking about your experiences and then you integrate and process that and then you move on to the to the next one. No, it, and it's so true because that I apply that in my life now. That's one of those changes that really made such a positive difference in my life in the here and now. Is that I constantly do write life reviews. In fact, if I can't look back six months ago and say what a jerk I was. I'm really not learning and growing. Nobody, if not learning and growing, why are you here? And so that's why that life review was so important to me because not only did it enable me to grow there, but it enabled me to grow here once I learned the value of it. Like anytime, some people, when they find out their faults, they feel shame or they uncomfortable or they deny it. Me, I get excited. I get excited because it's okay. I'm going to learn it. I'm going to grow from this. I am. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it. And, and I don't even have that. Sometimes it, you know, can upset people close to me. Like when I make mistakes, it really doesn't bother me that much. I have empathy and remorse in those things, but I don't beat myself over the head for it. As long as I learn from it, I'm not a person of malice. I really not concerned about that. It's just, you learn and grow. And that's, and that's really, that's really the mission. That's what I learned at least from those life experiences. I know time is, is a relative thing and time doesn't really exist when you're outside of this physical reality, but how many of those life experience reviews do you, oh, you, you did actually say closer to infinity than one. one but, yeah. but, but I want to say something about the time, because that's a really important point that you raised is that time didn't exist there. Like it exists here. For instance, here you have appointments in the future. You can see the calendar. You can cook. The grass grows. The weather changes. There, it isn't like that. Everything's about the experiences. Nothing, none of this happens unless it's part of an experience. And so really the way that you sense time and time moving on is that you sense your personal growth, all the understandings, how you learned along the way. And that when I was going through my life review is that what gave my sense of time is that I remember when I started my life review, where I was mentally and how I had to work through all of this stuff to get where I, my understanding is now. And that gave you the sense of time. That's why I believe so much. Everything about life is getting experiences. If you went home on a mountain all day, and, I, and that may be important for some people, I don't know, but you're not getting life experiences. You have to be out there. You have to laugh. You have to cry. You have to make mistakes. You have to love. You have to do all of these things and still be able to dust yourself off at the end of the day and put one foot in front of the other. So you get so many more of these life experiences. If I didn't have these life experiences, I would have nothing. I would be bored, but really time wouldn't move at all because I'd have nothing to reflect upon. At least that's what I believe. So the life reviews came to an end at some point. Was there always someone there with you or, or did you just have this general sense of uh, spirit or the creator that was there with you as you were going through that? I, I know this is very much unlike many other people's life NDEs, but I didn't sense like an individual, like a Jesus or a God. It was everything was all around. It was like, it was everything. Like I remember when I was a kid, they would say God is everywhere. And I'd be like little eyes. You could, you could see me going to the bathroom. It was like, it, you, know, you would have those kind of thoughts as a child, but it wasn't until I was in that other place where it's everything. And that's what gave me the understanding, at least what I felt was that the creator and the creation are one is that it wasn't like, one set of eyes. It was like a complete understanding that surrounded everything. And I, I hope that answers your question. I can mm. babble on. A lot. It's a paradigm, isn't it? Because we see with our eyes, we individualize things. And to try to explain something that's outside of that paradigm, it's not an easy thing to either explain or grasp, I think. It's very true. But but I, I do think it's important to, for me to do my best because having that life review is one of those lessons 
that you could really learn in the here and now that would change your life is to have a very critical but honest and kind eye towards yourself, but truly to identify those faults in yourself, which you can learn and grow. A lot of the things, a lot of the issues that we have in life, we've ingrained them when they happen. Like if a dog bites you when you're seven years old, you can go through your whole life and just be afraid of dogs and react all of a sudden towards dogs, as opposed to if you were to review that situation with the understanding the life experience of a 40 or 50 year, year old, you may now understand is that you could tell the difference between an aggressive dog and a friendly dog. So you don't have to be afraid of all dogs. You have to use your sense to figure it out. And though that's what a life review does. It releases those blockages. You can have that blockage for all your life and never be around dogs and be very afraid of them. Or you can revisit it with the wisdom of your life experience. And that's really the true beauty of the life review and how it's manifested in our lives here and now. It's one of those things. Do it. You'll, you'll be a happier person, in my humble opinion. While you're there having your life reviews, what else did you see? And did you have, were your senses like sight? Could you hear things? Could you smell things? Could you touch things? Was that there or was it something different to that? It was different. And what I mean by that is when I say I, I talked, I really didn't talk. Nobody talked. It was just an awareness. Even, even when I was playing that game with my friend, it wasn't like we really talked. It was like, uh, it's tough to say how the communication was, but I knew what he was wanted to know and wanted to share. And I could tell he knew what I wanted to know or what I wanted to share. And that's the way it went. It wasn't like, like Star Trek when the head moves and the seat pumping and you hear someone talking, but they're not talking like you read the band. No, it's not that. It's that you can feel certain things and it has nothing to do with speech. You can feel and sense intent and knowledge. And that's how I interacted. It wasn't that like I, I can walk to the store or something. It was that these scenes played over and over again. I couldn't choose where I was going or what I was doing. I didn't try. I didn't try. I, I just, everything just happened. But once I was in that situation, it appeared to me that I had a lot of free will on what I can choose to do or what I could choose to understand is that it was almost like a play is that is that you had the scene all your focus was what was going on there there could be all stuff around me or there could be nothing around me i wouldn't know because it just didn't occur to you to focus on that because everything was about this interaction that was going on so it wasn't that i ate or slept unless that was part of the experience and for me i didn't have those kind of experiences but later on there was one point where i saw sunsets and rises and falls every day, but that wasn't marking time. That was part of that experience that was very important. And, and so it's, it was just, just a surreal experience. I, after I was experiencing my life review, when I learned all I was going to learn from that, everything stopped and everything changed. And the next thing is I was put in charge of some young adults and I, I had to teach them a task and no matter what, they wouldn't listen to me. No matter what I did, they wouldn't, they would act. No, really, they, they, they would act like they got everything. Like, okay, yep. And then when it was time to do it, they would scatter. And then I would see them later and they would act like nothing's wrong. It was like something wasn't clicking. Was, I, and I was failing miserable. I, I was failing. And then I, I went to who I thought was like in charge of things. And I want to express how I felt and try to figure out what was going on. And as I stood before, I don't know, the owner who was in charge, I realized something is that I realized that I was standing before myself, not myself, Stevie Weber, but my higher self. Like it was then it became apparent to me that perhaps part of you is always in spirit and part of you has a human incarnation or a physical incarnation to learn and to grow and to make the mistakes that your higher self couldn't make to enable you to have those experiences that enable you to learn and grow, 
which is perhaps the very meaning of life, is that to continue the spiritual evolution, this awareness evolution, how the more you raise your consciousness, you raise the consciousness of everything around you. And so once I started to stand before my higher self, is that I couldn't read my mind. <laughs> I couldn't tell why I felt the way I felt or the knowledge that I had. But by standing in that grace, just that understanding, it wasn't like I was answering or asking questions, but just by being in that aura, that energy, things just appeared to me to be more clear. It's not like someone put a thought in my head. It was just by being there, like all of a sudden I looked around at the kids and I realized I had it all wrong, is that I wasn't there to teach them a task. What I was there to do is that these children were spirits who had yet to experience their first human incarnation. And I was here, I was being tested to see if I could shepherd those young children, those young adults, those young spirits into their first human incarnation. And what I was doing is I was failing miserably because that I had spent all this time to learn about spirit, be able to send spirit and life reviews and everything else. And finally, when I was put in the situation to mentor these spirit, I didn't see them as spirit. I saw them as dumb kids who wouldn't listen. Like I was taught all these things and I didn't apply any of it. There was this lady there who didn't do anything. And it seems strange, but everyone had a role there. But there was this lady there who just prayed. And, and I couldn't hear her words that she was praying. But I felt like this energy coming from her that was just so beautiful and so intent and so love, but love with wisdom. It's not just love, it's love with wisdom. And it was almost like the words was a, was a road in which this intent traveled. It really wasn't like the words matter. It was just like the highway for this beautiful, loving energy. And when I was in this place, that loving energy really gave me strength at some of the most difficult points when I was dealing with the situation. It was like, I couldn't hear the prayer, but I felt that loving energy. And that was, if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't have made it. I really wouldn't have. I don't think so. And then once I understood that, everything came into line. It was then I began to realize that perhaps your spirit was created with the universe, but it learns and grows over periods of time through many incarnations. That it's not so much, I believe, that's not so much you're reincarnated as a new person or a new body or just yourself and you just forgot your other lives. It's really what I began to understand is that your spirit grows through many incarnations, many as animals, as plants, as all different types of things. And at each stage, you learn how to have love and compassion. Does an alligator have love and compassion? I don't think so. But once creatures start taking care of their children, then they start to understand love and compassion. And I truly believe that the spirit learns and grows through many of these experiences, once again, to elevate the awareness and the consciousness. And once I, I was up to shepherd those kids off to their experience, to their physical experience, is that I had my very next and final experience in that place. I come from a small town on Long Island called Kings Park, and that's in New York in the USA. And there's a big bluff. It's like a cliff that overlooks the Long Island Sound. And everybody from town at the end of every day, we all go down to the shore. That's a small redneck town. <laughs> and we go down to the bluffs and we have red solo cups. Some people drink coffee and other people drink other stuff from the red solo cup. And we talk about what's going on in town, who's doing who, and all those small town gossip, which makes small towns fun. And I would sit there with my two friends when I was in this place, Joey and John. I knew them from town and they were good friends of mine. They were, they were much older than me, but they were talkers. They were rocking tours. They were these two Irish guys who still spoke with the brogue and they could tell a tale. I just really, they did a lot of fun. And, and Joey, he had broken his back when he was a kid 
right at the bluff where, where, where we were. He was diving in the water. It was shallow. And they actually had to put metal implants in his back and stabilize him. And that was years ago when that was really new. And then Johnny, he like did the readings in church. And he was like the voice of God when he was like, he had this voice that was like, and Jesus said, and like the ground would shake. He was really a good guy. I really liked him a lot. And, and I would sit there and I'd watch sunset with them every day day but the sunset wasn't marking time it was the reason why we were there because each time i saw the sunset go eventually i came to the realization that both joey and john had died earlier that year and i thought to myself how could this be happening really how could this be happening is that up until this point a lot of crazy stuff was going on but for some reason i don't know it didn't register with, with me. He was like, I was just going with it. I was having, up until this point, I was having a wonderful experience and I just didn't question anything. I don't know why it sounds so odd that these strange things were happening, but I was just dealing with it and it was okay. I was fine. I certainly didn't remember any accident I was in. And when I came to this realization, I started to think to myself, I wanted to ask them like, how are they here? Why are they here? I know your past, like, how could you be here? And I kept on thinking about asking them. And I say that, well, like I was saying before, it's not like we really talk. It's if I wanted to, this to be known, I would have made it known. And each time this happened is that for some reason, I didn't want to ask them. I'm not exactly sure why, but I probably didn't want to know the answer is I just didn't want to ask them. And then finally, each time we went through this experience, as I started to get the feeling that if I didn't ask them now, I would never get a chance to ask them again. And this started building up. And then finally, one time as I had made it known that I wanted to know why they were here. And they said, is that they wanted to make sure that I was all right. And I didn't know what they meant by this because there's nothing wrong with me. I was fine. And it was like echoing in my mind. I'm all right. I'm fine. I'm all right. It was like, it was just so surreal to me. And then as the sun started to set, it just got brighter and brighter. And then I shielded my eyes. And then eventually I took my hands off my eyes and I was in my hospital room and my mother was holding my hand. And she was telling me that I had been in this terrible accident, but, and I was very injured, but everything was going to be all right. I'm going to be fine. And, and that was my return back. But in so many ways, that's just the start of the experience because I, I thought it was the drugs. Like I thought of this experience afterwards. And a lot of times I joked about it with friends. I would, I really did is, is that I really made fun of it. It was like, Hey, I have a six pack to go. It was, it was wow. That was a trip, man. It was like, it, I didn't believe it. And, but I was just so gravely ill. I couldn't walk for a year and, and it was just so tough. But I remembered a couple of things is first off is I remember that lady who was praying and I could see spirit now. And I knew who that lady was. That lady was a dear friend of mine, Kathy. She was, I was on the school board. And so she was like one of the school moms. Our kids went to class together. We did field trips. We ran an organization called the Kings Park Network to have positive change in our community and everything. And, and we were good friends. We, we would walk our dogs together. And she was a little kooky. She was into saints and things like that. Things I kind of made fun of her over it, but she was good humored about it. And, and so I called her right away. As soon as I, I was tied down, which was very strange. It's the first time I was tied down with my clothes on before. So it was very strange. It took me a little time to get used to that. <laughs> but as soon as I was able to get, I was intubated. I couldn't move. I had this tube down my throat. And that sat like a long time. I was like that. And uh, but as soon as I got all that stuff out of me, I texted my friend and I told her that I heard her prayers. And she said, you heard my prayers? How did you know? And I told her that, that I was in a place that not here, not there, where you can hear prayers. And I heard your prayers and it gave me strength at the most difficult time I was there. And I thank you for that. 
And she told me how she prayed every day at the exact same time. And she made sure to send me that, that love and light. And I really, so if I have any advice to anybody is that prayers work, but it's, it's almost like the words don't matter. It's the intent. It's the love and the caring and the intelligence that you put behind those prayers. That is really just a highway, a vehicle for sending that into spirit. I really believe that. And it wasn't for Kathy. I wouldn't have uh, made it. And also Kathy was an athlete. And so she helped me recover. And she was like halfway between Sergeant Slaughter and Mother Teresa. You know, <laughs> you, you know, like, but like at, at times she was so tough and so mean. But other times she was just so kind and supportive. And but there was something else there is that I felt like a surety of outcome, almost like I've been down this road before, but I hadn't. Like I knew that if I did these things and I tried real hard, and I didn't give up. I didn't get discouraged. I would get better. I would be able to walk and these things would happen. And I was so sure of this. I drove the poor people crazy in rehab because I would sneak out of my room. I'd be in my walker and I'd, I'd be shuffling down the hall and stuff. And they'd tell me I'd have to get back in my room. And it was then I realized what Joey and Johnny meant about What Joey and Johnny meant about making sure I was going to be okay. They didn't mean there. They meant here. Because uh. I believe that they were my spirit guides. And like John's leg, he died of diabetes. His leg was all infected. My leg was all crushed. My back was all busted up. I had all these metal implants, just like my friend Joey. How did this happen? Like, how did they... How do I feel that energy? How does that happen? No, I'm certain they were my spirit guides and I was benefiting from their knowledge. Not like they were telling me one more push up, but it was that understanding that if I did these things, I would get better. And it was really true. I felt like I, I did. I made tremendous re recovery. In fact, I meet some of my friends from high school now. I'm in better shape than they are. Nothing happened to them. <laughs> it's just, it's all about motivation and, and getting that energy, really feeling that the, from my spirit guides and Kathy, you know, well, get going, Steve. But it really was. And things were going pretty good then. I was starting to get my sea legs back. I had returned to work. And then my son died of a drug oh. overdose. And, um, um, thank you. And, uh, you know, it happened so quickly. A lot of families have long histories, but he was, he was a tremendous musician. He could play the guitar like Jimi Hendrix. He could play the saxophone like Dizzy Gillespie played the horn. He, what did he play? The guitar and the piano. He played the piano like Mozart. He just, he would, I remember the piano teacher used to yell and scream at my son because he was playing all these very complicated pieces. My son would say, what, am I playing it wrong? He's, he would say, no, but you have no idea what you're playing. It was like, it was such a blast. And he was gone. He was a championship wrestler. He was on a scholarship to an engineering, top engineering school in the United States. And it was just, oh, it just happened all of a sudden. And, and I had to do a lot of soul searching because being an old personality wasn't so funny now, like the Harley Davidsons and the pretty girls and the beer and stuff. It wasn't that funny now. I was a committed father, 100%. But I often thought, did I make the best example? But these are things you just run over your mind over and over again. You just try to figure out. And this is when I started to become pretty close to my friend, Kathy, is that we were spending a lot of time together. And sometimes I would share stuff about the place between here and there with her. And then one day as I was sharing it and I like made a joke and Kathy said, Steve, are you looking at me? I'm not laughing. She said that that was real. And the things you learned there is preparing you for what you're experiencing now. And I think she was right because that it was such a difficult thing. And I had to begin to come to terms with it. And Kathy, she was very kind about it. She was a little, she was a little kooky about things about spirit. At least I thought at the time, but I later learned that perhaps she, one of us was kooky and perhaps it wasn't her, but who knows? And, and so my cousin, 
had gone to a medium, mediums channel spirit, yeah. and went to a medium and to get in contact, I think, with her grandmother. And instead of her grandmother coming through, my son came through. And there were a few validations about my son playing football with her son and the medium read off the numbers on the jerseys and also said that he had a synchronicity with St. Teresa. And that's like the Catholic saint, the little flower and roses. And the psychic had asked if we had seen flowers like roses. And it was so weird because Kathy and I, we were hiking as part of my rehabilitation and we'd be seeing roses all over on the trails, like in the middle of winter. And Kathy would say, oh, someone's trying to send us a message. And I would say, yeah, they they dropped a rose. That's the message they're sending. (laughs) And she'd say, no, this is so odd. And so when my cousin came back with this information about Nick and St. Teresa and roses, I just thought it was a whole lot of poppycock. I just, I thought she looked on Facebook. What? I just didn't buy. And that really upset Kathy because she felt like this was the, 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 you know, the missing link that Steve would really buy into this. And that went on for a while. And then one day, it was about a year after my son's passing, is that a friend gave us a St. Teresa card, like a mass card. And so what we had done is that we had found like a brook by babbling brook. You know, we had put a, a statue of St. Teresa there and we had a big magic marker and we wrote a prayer on it and we put the rock down. And then we came back like a month later and there was a hundred rocks there. It was, it was with yeah. all prayers on it for lost children or even I need a job or I like this girl, even something as simple as those things. But everybody started writing prayers down. And it was then I started to really begin to heal because I began to remind me of that Sting song, Message in a Bottle, where he was miserable, he put a message in a bottle, he expected an answer, but he got 10,000 bottles back instead, asking for help. And, and that's the way I felt, but it reminded me of that place. It wasn't that nobody wanted to listen. It was like we were all in this together. Really, that, mm-hmm. that, that we all have these problems, we all have these things. I'm not the first person to have lost a child or lost a loved one. And we're all in this together. I really have to rely on each other and be there for each other. It really helped me to understand that. But it was then I looked down on the mass card and it said St. Teresa was born on January 2nd. That was my son's birthday. And then I, I'm not done. (laughs) And then I read the day she was canonized. That was the day my son died. Going like, like, how does that happen? It was like, really, I can understand one thing, but both things, statistically speaking, that's crazy. And then with the flowers and everything, like, I, I, I had to sleep on this. I, I really, it was very like. <laughs> and then that night, I had this dream. It was a dream that so many times people have when they've lost a loved one, is that. The loved one comes back to them and it's everything's okay. It's like nothing of this. It's well, it's, it felt like nothing of this really happened. And then when I woke up, as I realized it was just a dream, but it was okay. Now it really was okay because that I began to understand that place was real and that my son was in that place now. And he was transitioning and he was experiencing all of those beautiful things that I experienced. And just as spirits grow and we have our higher selves that I'm certain I will see him again, not as father and son, but truly as part of our whole spiritual existence. And it will be beautiful. But until that time comes, I was going to make the best out of life. I was going to be happy again. I was going to be sad again. I was going to enjoy and make the most out of it. My, my daughter, such a beautiful girl, she was struggling with losing her, her brother. And so I had to focus on those types of things, not on myself. And, and it was beautiful. It really was so liberating for me because I began to understand everything. But that's not where it ends. Is that... They caught the fellow who sold my son the drugs. 
because I'm a computer guy. I had cameras all over the house when cameras weren't mm. cool. I was into it. Not that I lived in a dangerous neighborhood, just because you could do it. <laughs> and my son didn't have any other drugs in his system. He really didn't have his history of drug abuse besides beer and things that the kids can do. And, and they put him on trial and they charged him with second degree murder. The very same charge that they charged that fellow in the beginning, very same charge. And I thought, wow, how ironic that was. And it was, they were charging him federally. And in the United States, that's a big deal. If you get charged federally, you get 16 years. You, you're going to do 16 years. There's no, it's different. And, and so I went to go to the trial and, and I was really, hmm, I wanted to be angry. I really did. I wanted a pound of flesh. I knew how those parents felt in the beginning when after losing their child. And when I got there and I saw the defendant, I don't know. I just couldn't hate. I just, I couldn't do it. Like all I saw was a kid, a stupid drug addicted kid who made a terrible mistake, a mistake that he couldn't take back. What would it serve for me? I don't know. It might sound so sappy, so well, whatever, but I felt love for the kid. I really did. Is that I wanted things to be different. I wanted him to be able to put his life back together. We had to be held responsible because my son wasn't the only person who he'd hurt, the only person who died, but other people got very sick and it forensic changed their lives and granted buying drugs is your own choice. But when a drug is so addictive and you're so young and you really don't know about these things, it's just, and I felt for the kid and, you know, I think, and I don't know for sure, but I think that those parents experience from the beginning with that wrong way, drunk driver is that I think that was part of my life review. And I came to terms with that by living through their ex example and feeling what they felt and going through that over and over again in my life review. When I was put in that same situation, it's like I had the benefits of that and I was able to relieve myself of all of that negativity, all those negative feelings. And truly, really what I wanted for that kid is I wanted him to have a child someday to get out of jail and have a child and to love that child, maybe a son and nurture him and bring him to wrestling practice, go to his wedding and see grandchildren. And maybe someday when your day comes, you'll be surrounded by your great grandchildren in bed. That would be payback for me. That truly would to have a life well lived. And so I understand Stevie Webb is not making criminal justice law. And I am a full believer in law and order in this world. So I'm not saying anything about anything except for my personal experience is that I found a way to love after all of that, after all these experiences. And so when I tell you and when I share with you and your audience about the near death experience was just part. It was just part of a longer, a more intense story that, that how did this happen? I had this crazy experience with this wrong way, drunk driver and the death of this young lady. Then I had my near death experience, a crazy, crazy. And I survived to tell about it. I often say like I took a spiritual shortcut because all I did was survive, but it's really true. I had this crazy near death experience and then I lost my son. And then we had a trial that so paralleled everything. And I thought like, how did all this happen? Is there a master design to things or is the stage set? Sometimes I hear people say, oh, that's your life plan. You plan this. I never got that feeling. I never, you know, that like, like you have the wisdom to plan your life plan to, I don't know. I don't have all the answers. All I have is my experience, but it seems so odd how these things fit together. And truly since, since having these experiences and coming to terms, like my life has changed so much. There's certain gifts that I take with me now. And one of those things is, is signs and synchronicities is to really understand those messages that we receive from spirit and that and then you have to get rid of the oh, wow factor. A lot of times when people receive a sign, they're like, oh, wow, grandma, that's, you know, blah, blah, blah. But once you start to examine why you're seeing this message or why you're feeling this message, 
all of a sudden it opens up this gateway of communication. Your spirit knows that they can communicate with you and understand, and you could understand those. And sometimes a message in and of itself is just one message and it tells the whole story. But other times, messages from spirit is a sequence of messages to educate you and bring you a level of understanding. And it's really true, at least for me, is that once I started opening up my eyes, I started to see these messages. In my book, The Place Between Here and There, is that I write about, about this one experience that really changed the way I felt about mediums and psychics and spirit communication. Because I remember the first time that my friend Kathy, kooky Kathy, <laughs> said to me one afternoon, she said, has my son ever tried to contact me? I thought she was batshit crazy because I, I'm dealing with this grief and she's talking about my son contacting me. Oh, what am I supposed to go to a medium and they're going to tell me stuff about my son? Like, I want to know part of this. I didn't understand any of this. and I didn't buy a lot of it. And, um, but hmm, one day, Kathy and I, during the health crisis that we've all had to go through, the whole world has suffered through, I had decided to write this book about my experience and Kathy was helping me with it. We were doing it together and we were just taking a break from it and we were walking along the beach on Long Island. And one of Kathy's favorite pastimes is collecting beach glass and it would, it would roll up on the beach and she had jars and jars of it all over the house. We, we, we were going to have to get another extension on the house just to take care of all of her beach glass. And she's a big saint person and she always prays to the saint called Saint Germain, the violet flame. So when we're walking on the beach, she's praying to St. Germain to heal the world. And first off, if it wasn't for Kathy, things would have been a lot worse. <laughs> she, she's doing all those prayers for us. And, and I, I, I do believe it helps. But she wanted a sign from St. Germain that he had heard her prayers and that he was going to help her heal the world. And so she asked for to find violet beach glass, like St. Germain, mm. the violet flame. So she wants to find violet beach glass on Long Island. You will find hen's teeth before you will find violet beach glass. It doesn't exist. Just no way. And I knew she was going to be disappointed because she can really get wrapped up in this stuff. And, uh, and so we're on our way back and I thought she was almost crying and that she was really upset. She didn't find the violet beach glass. And then just right then out of just out of nowhere, this Dalmatian puppy, Dalmatian, like 101 Dalmatian, like a white puppy with black spots all over it, comes running out from behind a sand dune and starts jumping all over us. I was thrilled. I love doggies. I have no problem with a dog jumping on me. And we were just, I was patting its head and like pushing it around. And the owner comes running from behind the sand dune saying, oh, I'm sorry. It's a puppy. Got away. And we're like, no problem. And we ch ch chatted with the lady for a little bit. And so I asked her, what's the dog's name? <laughs> You're not going to say Violet. <laughs> wow. And I think to myself, like, how could this Dalmatian, how does a Dalmatian puppy, how does that beat Violet? There's nothing could be further from the truth. And so I'm like in shock and Kathy doesn't get it at all. And so the lady runs off with, with, with the dog. And so we're walking away and I'm like, Kathy, the dog's name is Violet. And she finally got it. And I was like, that's a sign. That has to be a message. What does that mean? Really? What? We have to find this lady again. And so what had happened and a few weeks later, people walk on the same beaches all the time. And we see her again. And she's running with that. And the dog, of course, is off leash again, jumping all over us. And we're like, hey, how you doing and stuff. And so we told her the story about the Violet Beach class and the Violet dog. And she was so thrilled about it. And she started to tell me how her son and her, they used to watch Gone with the Wind. It was their favorite show. They like had one of these big screen TVs and, and they just, they loved it. And they loved Scarlett O'Hara and her sassiness. And, and Brett Butler gave her this big violet dress at one point that she wears. And it's beautiful. And she decided to name the dog Violet. But instead of spelling it like Violet, she spelt it the way Scarlet spells her name. She lost her son just a few months before that. 
and we became very good friends and we we're both struggling with so many of the same issues and like how does that happen like how does it happen violent beach glass violent dog mom loses baby young son like my son and we're brought together at such a critical time in the world is that a coincidence really really is that a coincidence and that's really what's what sold me is that I started to believe that no, really, there is spirit. We are spirit. We're all connected. This is all real. My experience was real. Life is real. And we have to go out and enjoy it and make the very best of everything. Laugh, cry. And, and just as we opened up our discussion, if I could leave people with just this one thought is that life is good and people are good, even when very sad things happen. And in so many ways, these are just silly words that Stevie says, but if you could find out why for your own self in your own way, why this is true, I'm certain you will find peace in this world and any other world that comes afterwards. I've found a way to be happy again. I found a way to share my experience, not only with people who are interested in near death experiences and, and that this perhaps isn't a one and done thing and that we have so much to learn and grow, but also those people who are suffering from loss who understands that when you say there's something else, there really is, and it's beautiful, and there is a meaning towards everything, is that I didn't see Jesus and I didn't see pretty clouds or flowers and all those wonderful things that many other people did, but the beauty I felt was the bliss, the bliss of understanding is that a lot of times people believe there's perhaps two paths to enlightenment. One is one of devotion, and the other one is one of understanding. And I'm more the understanding type. And it just so happens, I think I had that experience at the right time, and I'm very grateful. And without the, with the exception of losing my son, is that I wouldn't have changed a bit about anything of my life. And I'm so happy now, and I feel very blessed. Thanks for sharing your story, Steve. Uh, if anyone's got any questions, are you open to answering those? And what's the best way for people to get in touch with you and find out what else you've got going on? Yeah, well, one of the best things is first off, my book is The Place Between Here and There. It's available on Amazon. It's in Spanish. It's an audio book in Kindle. And it's really a beautiful story. It's about love and life. And there are some tough spots in the book, but you'll leave feeling happy and refreshed. And you really will. It's a beautiful story and I recommend it highly. Of course I do. But, but also is that we have a Facebook page and my email address is Steve, S-T-E-V-E -E, at betweenhereandthere.org. Steve at betweenhereandthere.org. And I'm sure you'll put our social media in the description oh. of, the, of the video. And please reach out to us. We talk to a lot of people and we share really. It's a Om Namo Guru Dev Namo. That means I honor the honor in a teacher and student inside each of us. And we all have something to share. It's just like the lady with the violet dog is that we're brought together. And in that situation, we were both teachers and students of each other. And that that's really the path. The story, it's a beautiful story. And, and then since then is that right now, as I'm living in Florida, we, we had mentioned this, I live in paradise. This is paradise here. Every day is a beautiful day. There's palm trees all over the place. And, um, you know, it's so odd. I came here for the weather, but I realized it's the people. It really is. People are just so kind here and just being part of a community. And it's just, life is good. I, I don't, can't ride motorcycles anymore. I put my family through enough trauma, although I would love to ride <laughs> motorcycles. And maybe someday, <laughs> but I have these electric e-bikes and I just love them because I go off-roading all the time and I have all these scooters and unit cycles. And so I have all my toys that I do and I still work. I work remotely. I'm an engineer. So I love that. But, uh, but my real passion in life right now is I teach a yoga class, a meditation class. I called it Mantras, Meditations and Good Vibrations. And I teach another class called Kundalini Kriya. It's a type of yoga. It's like a celebration where we just really enjoy a lot of different music, you know, different asanas and exercises. I have this huge gong. That's, it's this immense gong. I have it on wheels. And I live about 50 yards from the venue. So I just roll it out my front door. I bring it to the venue <laughs> and I play the gong. And 
it's just so much fun and I just I'm really enjoying life. I truly am. I bet that makes you well known in the neighborhood, the goal. No, it's the best advertisement because I walk, I push it down the block. Everyone says, Oh, Steve, where are you going? Like, come on, come on down. And and, and I get like fifty to a hundred people each time. Each time, fifty to a hundred people show up and either for the yoga and the meditation or just the meditation class. And it really makes a difference because we truly are all connected and everyone has the same desires and wants and need to just get a break from this crazy world. Uh, it's funny you should mention Kriya Yoga because one of my previous guests who was also a near-death experience with Peter Panagor is into Kriya Yoga. Is he someone that you know, Steve? <laughs> yes. As, you know, I was really struggling when I had first wrote the book, The Place Between Here and There, because people would come to me as I was knowledgeable about spiritual matters. And really, I took a shortcut, you know, because that it wasn't all I did was survive. People study all these years and have all these letters after their name. And uh, all I did was survive. And I felt so awkward at times when people would come and tell me, you know, share their stories with me. And it was really weighing heavy on me. Then I was really depressed about it because I felt like I was an imposter. And so I reached out to this one guy. I think he was on HBO or I saw him on like a, uh, you know, some sort of major outlet. I found him on Facebook. And I sent him an email message and I just asked him, you know, I told him what I was going through and I told him I felt very uncomfortable. And he seemed like it was a guy who had his stuff together and he was counseling people. And so I began this pen pal relationship and his name was Peter, Peter Tyragon. Yeah, because he and used I to really, have a mainstream television show on a, on a TV network for like 15 years or something, yeah. I think it was. Yeah. And, and he responded right back and... I had this pen pal relationship with him for several months. He was walking me through, spending a lot of time. And was walking me through and helping me come to terms with things because he felt the same way. Because I, I think that that's the way he connected was the whole idea of taking a spiritual shortcut. And he really, he got me into a good place. And so when I told him goodbye and I said, Peter, I said, if someday a guy comes up to you, a stranger, and gives you a big hug, You'll know it's me. And he laughed and that was that. And so roll it forward to this year. There's this group called the International Association of Near-Death Studies. Yep. They had invited me to speak at their conference. And this was a surreal experience for me because other than seeing a small clip by Peters, I never even talked to anyone who's had a near-death experience. I never listened to anyone's stories. Part of it was that I had my own experience and I, it, it, it's complicated, but I just wasn't a part of anyone else's stories. And But that conference was great. All of a sudden, I met all these people, and it really changed, helped me come to terms to things. But I look at the very first day before everyone gets there, Peter Paragon is speaking, and he's speaking about Kriya Yoga. So I was like, I'm going to his thing. And, and so I go to him. I never saw him in person before. And he's sitting there, he's talking in front of the group. And at the end, he asks for questions. And then everyone asks questions. And I wait until it's, they're very sticklers about time there. So I knew they were going to, you know, when the time was up. So I wait, I was the last question. I raised my hand, he called on me. And I told him, I said, and he mentioned shortcuts again in his speech that day. And I said, Peter, I said, you mentioned shortcuts, spiritual shortcuts. And you're not feeling worthy to explain these things. And that kind of brought you to Kriya Yoga and other things. I said, I share a very same experience is that I, I, I felt like I took a spiritual shortcut. In fact, it was causing me a lot of trauma. And I explained to him the story, how I reached out to this fellow online and, and they counseled me. They really gave me some really good advice and made me through a really tough time. And I said, do you know who that person was? And he said, no. And I asked him, can I, can, can I approach you? He said, yeah. And I walked up to him, I gave him a big hug, and then he reached out with both hands and yelled at the top of his lung. He said, Steve! <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so that's, that's and, and a great guy. And I really learned a lesson, not only about Peter being a great guy, absolutely, and someone who gives to the community mm. and a wider community. Very generous. Not only yoga, I'm a yoga person, but, but also just being there, talking to other people, it was just a great experience. I'll never forget it. 
Yeah, that's a great story. Yeah, he's a good guy, Peter. My last guest said had this saying, life is to be lived. And I think that you're a great example of that, Steve. Despite what happens, life is to be lived. And it's the joy that you have for living really stands out to me. So let's wrap it up. Do you have one final message for people before we finish off our conversation today? Yeah, I would just say, I just have to reiterate is that so as long as you have breath in your body, you can make a difference. You can find happiness. And sometimes is some of the worst things that have happened to you really can be the greatest gift. They really are. And you could really agonize over terrible decisions you've made or other people have made against you. But really, there's a, there's a mantra which I love a lot. It's called the Mool Mantra. And it says, Ekron uh, uh, and that means life is about awareness and raising your awareness. And you raise your awareness through your experiences. So never have hate or animosity towards those people who bring you bad experiences. Don't allow them to do it because you have to learn. No, don't allow people. Be smart. When those things come, take them in stride and learn from them. And don't hate or have jealousy towards others or yourself. And you really, you'll find bliss in this world. No matter what, how crazy the world is, so many times one's prison bars are of their own construction. Break free. And you do that from right here. That's a great message. Steve, it's been my great pleasure to have you on the show today. I really appreciate you being my guest. Thank you so much. Best of success to you. I'm inspired by your journey and your message and you bring in this this information to your audience and just best of success. Sat now.